I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome back to It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. This is the first time all three of us have been in the same room in over a month. It has. I went to Canada and New England and... Kathy, we went further. I went to Germany and Austria. Lucky you. I went to the grocery store. (laughs) (laughs) My refrigerator's empty, so I'm kind of jealous. That's where I have to go today. You're one up on us. (laughs) Well, today we have an interview with Laura Lipman, who is a local girl, and she is this month's In Agatha's Footsteps author. Laura Lipman is a New York Times bestselling novelist who has won more than 20 awards for her fiction, including the Edgar Award, and has been nominated for 30 more. Since her debut in 1997, she has published 21 novels, a novella, a children's book, and a collection of short stories. Her books have been translated into over 20 languages. Lit Hub named her one of the essential female crime writers of the last hundred years. She has also written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Vulture, Real Simple, and T Magazine. Laura lives in Baltimore with her husband, David Simon, and their daughter. We apologize ahead of time for the quality of the audio on this interview. We ran into a technical glitch. We tried to clean it up as best we can. We hope you enjoy our effort. I would like to welcome Laura Lipman. She is the prolific author, and welcome, Laura. Thank you for having me. I loved the Tess Monahan series. Are they finished or are they going to come back? Well, they're not finished in my mind. They can't come back until I have the right idea. Lady in the Lake is a little bit of a reward to the Tess Monahan loyalists in that there are some Tess Monahan Easter eggs, if you will, hidden in there. We meet her mother, we meet her uncle, and we finally find out the backstory of Spike, a character in the early Tess Monahan novels whose connection to her family is somewhat hazy, and all we know about him is that he was once jailed for a felony, and that's why he can't have a liquor license in the state of Maryland. And his backstory is finally explained, and it's more tragic than I realized. (laughs) Now, your female protagonists in your last few books have been very dark compared to Tess. What made you decide to feature women such sad and tragic back? You know, that's a complicated question because it makes me unpack where do I start. And I usually start with sort of a story idea and a character at the same time, and they each inform one another. We go back to Wild Lake, which appeared in 2016 after the last test book. Lou in that book is someone who has reasons to be pretty melancholy and self-doubting, I would say, at the time in her life that we find her. She's someone who's had to revisit all of these things about herself and her family and her marriage. She wants to leave her true and maybe they're not. So that's the whole point of the book, is a woman at midlife looking at her childhood and thinking, I didn't know the half of things, so that leads to a, a melancholy story. Sunburn, which is the book that came after that, is about a woman who's been, been released from prison after murdering her husband. I mean, that's the setup. Who could she be? What would she be? What kind of second chance is she going to get? And then with Lady in the Lake, I don't find Maddie particularly tragic, except in her in curiosity, which I find to be her biggest flaw. I actually like Maddie, even though I don't think she's necessarily likable, but I do think she's relatable. I believe she is. She's not going to be your doting little housewife. Not anymore. For almost 
two decades, for 17 years of her life, I believe she would have been a happy marriage. I believe that she loved the man that she married, and she hasn't been filled with doubt, but she's on the verge of becoming an empty nester at a time when I doubt that term was even used. She's sensing that something's coming to an end, and then she gets to sort of like a postcard for her past that reminds her that, well, wait, once upon a time I thought I would do more and be more, which would have been a fairly progressive attitude for a young woman of her day. She's at a time when women were going back to school and were joining the workforce, not in huge numbers, but it was beginning. So I just think Maddie is emblematic of her time. I mean, I think she's really smart and really driven. She's dangerous in her self-centeredness. If anything, that would be my takeaway from the book, that you can be so wrapped up in yourself, you can't begin to see how you're affecting other people. And that's probably Maddie's Achilles heel. And by the end of the book, one senses that at least she has that self-knowledge. But again, it was, who is this woman and how is she going to solve the mystery of the Lady in the Lake? Lady in the Lake is based on an old case from Baltimore Pass. It's about the mysterious death of Shirley Parker back in 1965. Do you think with today's forensic ability, the case will ever be reopened? I don't think so. I just don't think there was anything in what was discovered at scene that would offer today's forensic science any new avenues into the case. A really nice, really nice man named Jonathan Hayes, who worked as a medical examiner, read about the case for me and talked to me about it at my request. He's also a novelist. He found it interesting and mysterious, but he didn't see any way that it could be solved now. It's a strange case because they can't even say officially that it was a homicide. Exactly. I might be misremembering. I probably should have gone back into my notes with Jonathan before we talked. I think Jonathan was surprised at some of the decisions and procedures that were followed at the time, but I don't think he saw any way that this case could be solved. So I will defer to his expertise and hope that I'm getting it right. It was very well written. I enjoyed it very much. Now, I love the twist in the story and commend you for blending fictional with actual aspects of the case. Without giving it away, what made you go down that road? Well, I hope I know what twist you're talking about because there are at least two. There are several. <laughs> I would say the big twist to me, which is sort of the big revelation about the Lady in the Lake. To me, it was not something I knew when I started the book, and now I have to be very general. Right. But it quickly occurred to me that it was the only possible explanation for some of the things that were happening. I tend to be an Occam's Razor kind of writer. My book don't tend to have really far-fetched solutions. They tend to have kind of down-to-earth explanations, things that you think, oh, of course, of course that's what happened. It's interesting because readers are so savvy and so sophisticated, and they're so used to the big conspiracies and the incredible twists that some writers in my genre specialize in, that when you keep it a little bit closer to the ground, somehow that can be more surprising. Readers are fantastic. Readers are so smart, and they're looking at everything, and they're examining all the clues, and they know more than Maddie does because they get in other people's heads, and they get information that Maddie doesn't have. And with all that, I was still hoping that the readers would be surprised by that big revelation about the Lady of the Lake. I was. That was a great twist. You did the Lion Sisters case back in What the Dead Know, now the Parker case. Are there any other cold cases in Baltimore you're going to look at? When I look at real-life crime, true crime, I'm interested in it thematically. And I'm always very careful to say that I was inspired by these stories, but that I wouldn't want anyone to think that in the process of writing a novel, I learn anything about the original case. I don't investigate. If anything, once I've decided that a real-life case has piqued my curiosity, I try to stay as far away from it as possible. So, like, right now, the book that I'm working on has no true crime inspiration that I can think of. No, absolutely not. But that's just how it happens. I mean, more often than not, over 23 books, I'm going to guess that at least 18 or 19 of them have some basis in a real crime. It's always been that interesting that an opportunity to look at something that excites my imagination. You mentioned the lion sisters. Yeah, two girls disappeared from Wheaton 
Plaza in the mid-1970s case, which appears to have now been at least possibly solved, was a mystery at the time I wrote about it. In real life, the Lion sisters are quite young. I think one's just about to turn 12 and one's just about to turn 10. They're, they're not teenagers. Right. They're girls, little girls, as the mother of a nine-year-old. That's how I would call them. And in the book, the minute I make those two girls teenagers, and they're 15 and 13, that's a whole different story now. Different. What I was interested in with the Lion sisters was the idea of female identity. How many roles one woman can inhabit in a single lifetime. And you have this mysterious woman show up at the beginning of What the Dead Now. And she says, do you remember those girls who disappeared? I'm one of them. And then she doesn't want to say anything more about herself. She just thinks she should be left alone to go on her way. But having introduced this idea that she holds the key to this long ago presumed homicide, and she can't be allowed to leave, through the course of that book, there's two things that are going on. First of all, we're seeing snapshots of that woman's life, and she's clearly been many different people in a way. She's been changing her name, changing her life, peripatetic. What's going on with her? Who, if she's not one of these sisters, who is she? And the other thing the book is interested in is grief. How does one grieve? And is there a right way to grieve? Of course not. And is anything in life ever fair? Of course it's not. And what the dead know, the beautiful parent, the parent who's not involved in an affair at the time the daughter's still missing, that parent is punished by life far more than the parent who would be seen as the not good parent. I really wanted to look at the fact that neither parent is right in the way they choose to grieve. They're definitely not wrong. They're grieving the way that they grieve. By this point, it has nothing to do with the original case. It's my ideas about life that were inspired by a real-life crime. How do you research? So the kind of research I do, as I just explained, I do almost no research into the original cases. In Lady in the Lake, I did have to look at the circumstances of the discovery of that body in order to make it work for my story. I had to know what the condition of the body was. I had to know a lot about that, but that's all I needed to know. What I do do is I research the time in which a story is set, even if I've lived through that time, even if I've lived through that time fairly recently. I mean, yes. I was in Baltimore in 1966, but I was seven years old. Even if my memory were perfect, I wouldn't understand the world in which my characters were moving through. So I go to the library, I look at newspapers and magazines, but I don't necessarily read the news, although sometimes I have to. I, I look at the ads. I think advertisements are an incredible window into the yearnings and desires of people. And by their yearnings and desires, we know people. So ads show me what people want, and in learning what people want, I think I know the characters and the times better. You tackle some pretty hot-button topics from the 60s. How did you approach the things like interracial relationships? That was kind of a no-no back then. It's a little against the law, I think. It's right around the time that the, the famous Supreme Court case is coming up. The way I approach topics is to not think of them as topics. I don't write about issues. I don't write about my political views. I write about my characters. Maddie, for whatever reason, well, I think that's part because to sort of me that Ferdy is incredibly attractive and sort of unlocks something in her that might have been locked up for a while. I mean, he is someone who pursues her sexually. I mean, understating the case of what happens between them the first time they go to bed together. I don't really think the reason that Maddie is secretive about Ferdy is because he's African American. I think she's secretive about him because she doesn't want to be publicly defined by a relationship with a man right now. Yeah, that's true. And I, the fact, and maybe that's what makes Ferdy attractive, is that she knows that this will be between the fact that he's pretty sick. Don't forget, Maddie's going to be a bit of a snob. <laughs> yes. She's not really sure why she's dating a police officer. So all of those things, I think she likes the secrecy of it. I think her window unlocked. Yes. So I think Maddie is excited by it. But I think it's really incidental. It, in other words, like Maddie at the same time, she could also be having an affair with a married man. Something without giving too much away, we find out might be part of Maddie's past. Maddie has an affinity for clandestine sexual care. She just does. It's, and by the way, that's going to be one of the constant through lines in her life. I don't think it gives that much away to say that at the end of the book, we need an older, more mature Maddie. And there's been a lot of changes in her life, but she still has her secret romances after all this time. And she prefers that to being a wife. I did like the character of Maddie, who was very complex, but she was very interesting, too. Good. I 
get up some more than that. Right. To go on a lighter note, I went to the Abington Library.